everyone. My name is Matt Mahan, District 10 Council Member. Excited to welcome everyone to our March meeting of the Smart, Smart Cities Committee. Looks like we have a quorum. Before we take roll, I did want to just quickly remind everyone, including our, um, our members of the public who are here, of our code of conduct. So uh, this includes Number one, commenting specifically on our agenda items. We wanna stay focused and on task and please only address the full committee, not individual council members. Public speakers will not engage in a conversation with the chair, council members or staff. All members of the committee, staff and public are expected to refrain from abusive language repeated failure to comply with the code of conduct, which will disturb, disrupt, or impede the orderly conduct of this meeting may result in removal from the meeting. Okay, this meeting of the Smart Cities and Services Improvements Committee will now come to order. Can the clerk please call the roll? Ricardo? Jones? Present. Foley? Here. Cohen? Here. Mahan? Here. Thank you. Great. And my understanding is that we have two edits to the committee work plan that were published to the public for today's agenda. Number one, we've deferred the lease and asset management system status report to April 7th, 2022, which is the next meeting of this committee. And number two, we have moved up the development services transformation status report from April to today's meeting. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to Rob Lloyd to uh, give us a little bit of orientation to today's meeting. Thank you, Chair. Um, good afternoon, Chairperson Mahan, Vice Mayor Jones, committee members and members of the public. Uh, Rob Lloyd, De Deputy City Manager for the City of San Jose. For our March meeting, city staffs will present three items. First, under agenda item D1, we will have the bi-monthly innovation and technology status report and Michael Foster of the IT Portfolio Products Projects Office will present uh, the projects and the validation work. Second, we have a key report on the city roadmap item uh, for development services transformation. Chris Burton and Alex Powell of the uh, PVCE department, Planning Building Code Enforcement, uh, will lead a cross-departmental update to the committee on service and workflow improvements for public and staffs. And then last, we have D3, uh, and we'll update the committee on a productivity software usability status report this item responds to direction the city council gave uh, at the approval of the city's Microsoft Enterprise Agreement in mid-2021 to address usability needs identified by council offices. And with that, we'll start with D1 and Michael Foster. All right, can everyone see my screen? Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you, Rob. Good afternoon, Chairperson, Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of the committee and members of the public. I am Michael Foster, Division Manager of C3PO uh, of ITD, here to present the Innovation and Technology Project Status Report. So first, I wanted to congratulate the entire team that worked on the downtown high-speed Wi-Fi project in partnership with Meta, aka Facebook, uh, Cambium Networks, Ruckus, and SmartWave. Uh, Sudhir Vangadi, the products project manager on the team, has accepted on behalf of the team the Cambium Networks Connectivity Hero Award. Uh, the, the entire team came through and the result is truly high-speed Wi-Fi in the downtown area. We're proud of the work the team has done to improve our city. Uh, the folks shown here are Keith Chow, Ed Kim, James Castillo, Sudhir Vangadi, Ryan Renato, Ho Lam, Arti Tongri, and Matt Opsel. So into the report, we'll start again with the now familiar city roadmap linking the technology and innovation work here at the city to this overall roadmap. And fade into where we last left our heroes uh, way back in December of 2021. And then fade into the latest version of the roadmap. As usual, I've got follow on slides for what's changed status, what's completed, what's new, and our overall project velocity. So, uh, First slide is the status changes. So there's a few here. We're a bit more colorful this month. Um, first is the first net deployment. We have an anticipated budget shortfall on that, but that is being addressed as part of the uh, fiscal year 22-23 budget process. 
Uh, the copier printer replacement, that is one of those 98% done projects, but we have some delays in pickups of the old Ricos and some final billing issues um, and some backordered deliveries for net new Toshibas because of ongoing supply chain issues in the world. And uh, we have final pickups, of course, and final billing scheduled this month with Rico, and we're prioritizing the Toshibas on the net new orders. Uh, EOC Next Generation Technology, we're awaiting budget approval on that, but that is also being addressed as part of the fiscal year uh, city budget process. Um, Microsoft Software Usability, so 60% of those issues are fixed and 40% are still to be resolved, but I don't want to steal Ashish's thunder. You'll be hearing about that more in the next presentation. Um, we talked about adding four new services to SJ311, but that is a bit delayed due to an underlying architecture upgrade that's needed first. Luckily, that um, underlying up architecture upgrade is happening this weekend, and uh, things should get a lot better. Uh, city building security cameras. So the planning and preparation is complete, but we are working on a procurement method and timing for that, uh, and we're working that, that out with Public Works. Then finally, the business tax system is behind schedule by at least four months, um, but it is happening right now, and actually there's more detail on that later in this presentation. Next, um, recently comp completed projects. So the violent crime mitigation system pilot in the Cadillac neighborhood has, has ended its pilot and the system is now shut down. Uh, the next steps are for the PD folks to analyze the data and act on the lessons learned there. Um, secondly, the airport Wi-Fi upgrade, although delayed as you can see, has completed at SJC. It's actually nice and fast. I've used it myself recently. And then on net new projects appearing. So they're both in the get, just getting started status. The first is the Beautify SJ and Homeless Encampments platform. This will be a new uh, unified work order system that will take requests from the public and council, convert them into tickets, route them to the appropriate city department to fulfill, and inform the requester when completed. In addition, the platform will include analytics and reporting to detail the success of the program. Uh, second on here is the upgrade to the system the budget office uses uh, to a next generation cloud hosted version. This is planned to occur this calendar year during their availability window. And on velocity, um, you can see that we've still got plenty of project work. You'll notice there's a capacity line dropping in March. We like to consider that given the folks we currently have to properly focus on projects underway at any time, we maintain this capacity limit. We have had some turnover, but we also have some good candidates in the pipeline to help us in the future. And of course, um, additional projects are always rolling in. The next section is a deeper dive, um, the independent verification and validation reviews of three high profile projects. Once again, as a reminder, here's the criteria that was that ways projects get reviewed. And here are some example questions we asked to uncover the details on projects. Of course, questions aren't enough, and it is key in IVMD that we investigate and partner with the product owners, sponsors, and other stakeholders to confirm that the answers to these questions are accurate. So this month, looking at the top three ranked projects by the previously shown criteria, they are um, the business process automation, access east side, and the business tax system projects. There's no big surprises we found here, and the projects, though not without problems, were found to be accurately reporting their status whilst dealing with known funding and resource issues, of course. The value of all three of these projects remains strong, although until a vendor is chosen for BTS, its value is currently not known. Next, I'll zoom in a bit on each one of these projects to show where we're currently at. The business process automation project has been a success story this year with 63 internal and external processes automated so far. Although they've already surpassed their goal of 50 automations this fiscal year, the concern going forward is that with a decrease in developers, a slowdown in deployments is likely. Next is the East Side uh, Access East Side project. Three attendance areas are already live: James Lick, Overfelt, and Yerba Buena, and another five 
are now on an updated schedule for completion within roughly a year from now. Um, despite not achieving the original schedule, the five additional attendance areas are now either in construction or design phases. Though the value of these projects is clear, in the future, more data will be available to analyze the success and usage trends of these networks. And then finally, the business tax system is an important revenue application that is need, in need of renewal. As a complex system with highly customized requirements, it has had challenges achieving schedule goals. Currently, it is on track for getting in front of council this summer and to be live with the next generation system in 2023. As mentioned before, until a vendor is chosen for BTS, the value isn't known. Thank you, that's my report. Thank you, Michael. All right, why don't we head over to public comment? Once we have the timer up, great, thank you. We will let uh, call in user one, go ahead. Yeah, I understand that uh, you're gonna be putting some high standard in it in for people. What about the people who pay for it? I mean, we pay a lot of money for, for our internet and we're not able, we're, we're not, we have no access to high speed internet because we're what, one or two miles away from, you know, the switch or whatever they want to call it. So what about the people who pay versus the people who, you know, are going to pay very little? Uh, it, you know, we're the, we're the heart of the Silicon Valley here and I can't get high speed internet for, and I pay a lot of money. I mean, I know we're not supposed to ask questions, but, you know, this is my two minutes. And I'd like some answers on that. Why people who pay a lot of money and taxes on all of it get the worst internet access in the world? Thank you. Let's come back to the committee. Let's see if any of my colleagues have questions or comments. Okay. Michael, maybe I'll just ask very quickly and then we can entertain a motion if we need one here. I, I didn't quite follow on the business tax system what the cause of the delay was. Could you just restate that? Uh, Rob, you look like you want to say something. Sure. Yeah, I can handle this one. I'm um, the sponsor, one of the sponsors of the project's uh, chair. Uh, Rob Lloyd, um, deputy city manager. We actually, the procurement process took an extra uh, about four months to go through. We did an additional RFI request for information to clarify some points before we issued the procurement um, and to make sure we can ask uh, some specific items and get some context of what the options and costs were. So once that process was complete and we went through the procurement prioritization process, um, we, we did fall behind by about four months. Um, they are in selection right now though. Uh, so we'll update that schedule once the award, notice of intent to award is out uh, and get that signed, the charter update signed by all the, um, all the uh, sponsors and um, stakeholders in the project. I see. Okay, so that was that was time needed to gather more information to properly assess what correct. we need in the system. Correct, and we, we didn't uh, allocate enough time on that one, so we're just recognizing that we didn't hit our schedule as planned. Yep. Well, that's why we measure. It's good. We're not. It shouldn't always be green, right? It's, it's how we learn. So that's that's great. I appreciate that. Okay, I think I've given my colleagues ample time to consider questions. Not seeing any hands, I'd be happy to accept a motion to accept the status report. Move to accept the report. Second. Great. Let's vote. Jones. Aye. Foley. Aye. Cohen. Aye. Mayhem. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're on to item two, City Roadmap Development Services Transformation Status Report. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Chris Burton, Director, and Alex Powell, Chief of Staff of the Planning, Building, and Code Enforcement Department, We'll present for the teams on development services transformation. Uh, Jay Guevara from the Public Works Department and Assistant Chief Williams from the Fire Department are also here for questions at the conclusion. And uh, Chris, I think you're going to lead us off, right? Yep, great. <coughs> Excuse me, thanks, Rob. Um, and just to note, we also have uh, Chu Chen, our Assistant Director for PBC, on as well. We'll take all the hardest questions, of course. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and you can skip straight to our next slide. I don't know who's, who's driving. Is Alex driving? Um, so just a, a quick reminder, uh, chair and, and committee members, um, as Rob said, Chris Burton with uh, PBCE. So we were here previously just uh, in November of last year, so not that long ago, 
um, providing an update on our development services transformation work. Um, and we're here to continue that conversation, give you all the latest information uh, on the progress we've made and give the committee um, some, some of the follow-up uh, items regarding some of the questions that came up from our last presentation. So uh, next slide, please, Alex. Um, okay, so uh, just to you know, frame up the conversation, we're just, you know, this is a slide that you've obviously seen before. Um, and so as a reminder, these are the four objectives for how we measure and evaluate our work uh, in the, the transformation project. Um, so firstly, you know, does the project provide customers with a simple self-service digital tool? Um, does the project enhance the clarity, consistency, and effectiveness of process? Um, does it create and improve tools that support uh, internal teamwork? Um, and is it helping us as a team collaborate better across the development services spectrum? So obviously just reminding us that, you know, we're a number of departments that come together to <clears throat> facilitate and process uh, all of the development permits um, across the different departments. And so making sure that we're doing that in a collaborative and coordinated way. Next slide, please. <laughs> and so this is where we left off with the last presentation. Um, and so just as a reminder, these are really the three core projects that we're engaged with um, and how they relate ultimately to those objectives um, based on the, the second column that you have there. Um, these projects really have different impacts across the, the four different objectives, um, as you can see. Uh, and we're going to go into a little bit more of a deeper dive as we move through this presentation, particularly on the, the first and the third projects as it relates to the SJ permits version 2.1, um, which we see as uh, an important part of our, our tool set moving forwards. Um, and then also as it relates to the permit center appointments, um, as we continue just to evolve our service um, and think about new ways to deliver service to our customers. Next slide, please. Okay, and so <clears throat> there we go. So the look ahead. Um, so just to sort of dive through this a little bit. So in a moment, we're gonna uh, demo what the customer experience is for the new portal uh, in SJ permits. Um, we did miss our goals for uh, development and user testing. Uh, development is scheduled to be completed at 100% uh, by next Friday. Um, testing will be done by the end of next month. So we are progressing, um, but we're sort of acknowledging that we, uh, we didn't quite make our timelines there. We're still planning the full application deployment based on staff and customer needs uh, for adoption. Um, as the team completes the testing, uh, we'll be able to refocus and roll out the next phase of this project. For our SJE plans, um, the big highlights really that we're able to complete uh, the deployment of the Amanda permitting system modifications in January. Uh, this was a major investment of IT time and building staff time just to ensure that our, our permit workflows were ready to work together um, in the background. And uh, of the 400 changes that we did make, there were no bugs found uh, after we moved into production on, on this project item. The team started the re uh, requirement discussion with the vendor, uh, and we hope to complete the configuration this summer with a, a rollout shortly thereafter. Um, and we also just want to promote that this week, we've also launched another permit type um, for the planning team, um, which will be available through SJP plans as well. And then lastly, on the permit center appointments, um, <clears throat> We're gonna have more information on uh, a new process that we're rolling out in a few slides. Uh, this is our rapid online, uh, service uh, intake process, um, which we're, we're dubbing Rosie as the acronym. Uh, but I'm happy to announce that this new method for taking in applications has been successful so far. We've had good uh, feedback from our customers. Uh, customer satisfaction is up um, around those folks using that process. We're also seeing the benefits through staff productivity. Um, so, so as I said, we'll, we'll dive in a little bit more on what that process is, um, but we see that as a, a, a good step forward in uh, aligning our process with the needs of our customers. And so that's my kind of tee up up front. I'm gonna hand it over to Alex at this point to dive into some of the specifics. Alex. Thanks, Chris. Uh, so as Chris mentioned, we'll uh, talk about the, the first and third items on the on this sort of major project list. Uh, and I apologize, uh, Alex Powell, uh, Planning, Building, Code Enforcement, and Product Owner for the Development Service Transformation Team. So as Chris mentioned, um, we're still in the midst of development and testing uh, the new SJ permits, what we call sort of version 2.10 uh, specifically. 
Um, so what we wanted to do, we're at a phase now that we could actually start sharing more publicly what this looks like. And so in a minute, I'll start just a brief two and a half minute demo that walks through the major six phases of the application process. Again, going back to our last slide, this is really achieving that goal or that objective of giving uh, customers the digital tools that they need to really drive their process. So what we'll do is uh, actually go through the demo and, um, and show what that experience is like. This is a relatively abridged version. Um, there we go, the demo begins. Uh, a relatively abridged version, starting from SJ permits. Customers can go in, log in, or just click on applying for an online permit. I was already signed in, so I go straight to my, my services page where I can click on apply for a permit. Customers can still continue to pay for permits, schedule inspections, pay for their code enforcement multiple housing uh, residential occupancy permit. But once they start the application process, they'll be able to select what division or really what team they need a, a permit from. They can select the application type. In this case, I'm gonna choose a basic over-the-counter planning application for a signed permit, just for a commercial business that uh, would require a signed permit. Going through after the first step in the process, they'll go to adding the primary property. Um, again, they'll be able to look up their property on their own, um, or in some cases, if they already have, if they're the owner of a property, um, this could, uh, they'd be able to sort of add that in. But they'll be able to select and add a property that searches from our database. Um, so we get specific information and all the fields are populated. Again, not required for staff to add it themselves. They'll also have the ability to add additional properties if there were a larger project. Then the customer will have the ability to add additional collaborators to their team. I won't do that for this demo, uh, but they could for large, more complicated projects that require architects and other uh, professionals. On the next step, they'll actually add in some basic permit information. Our signed permits are relatively straightforward, um, not too much information required up front. And so I'll quickly populate those, identifying this as a non-residential warehouse project, not adjusting any permits, and just adding one sign. This will actually help develop what the fees are and give our staff the information needed to process their permit. Once that's all ready, they'll upload, upload their files, a feature that wasn't available on our previous version of the portal. They'll select the files that they need, upload them. These could be plans, these can be outside clearances, information that, again, our team needs um, for the application process. They can add in a description as well to help us identify really quickly what these files are. And after the files have uploaded successfully, of course, receiving a confirmation email and seeing that the right one was uploaded, they can proceed on to the next step, um, which in this case would actually be the final step in the process. Uh, different permits would have different steps. They would receive this confirmation page. They actually get their application, um, what's called a reference number or permit number. Um, since it's planning, this would be a, a reference number where they could actually find application information online and see all the steps in the process. We also include some post submission instructions. In this case, you know, if you don't hear from us in a couple of days, please email here to make sure that we follow up with you. So this was a very abridged version, again, showing just a two and a half minute, um, a very quick uh, sort of more expert uh, experience going through this. We would imagine many of the applications would um, require a little bit more steps and add more information to their process. But we want to give an early, uh, give some early insight to what this would uh, be like. So um, while this is good and our team is doing a great job of the development and testing of this work, um, I do want to call out the team that has been working very hard on not just the um, on not just the development testing um, on the development side from our IT team. I want to thank uh, Ray Berlay and Carolyn Nguyen um, who keep finding uh, solutions to issues we didn't know exist yet, and so really appreciate it. And then of course our four subject matter experts: Joe Dyke, Michelle Flores, Ron Chan, and Keith Paxton who've been testing and continue to test and find new improvements um, and ideas for our portal. But of course, uh, we really care about what is sort of the impact of this work and what do we expect to have happen. So again, we keep calling this the ad application. This is the new version, what will be available with SJ permits. And so what we're looking at here is actually by those different divisions, planning, building, public works, and fire protection teams how many new customers could actually apply for permits online in the first year of SJ permits to one zero. We use just a really basic sort of, if you go through that process, I know it's two and a half minutes for us, but for many customers in our staff, you know, the interaction and typing in uh, information from a PDF um, without having to edit their errors in the demo video would typically take about 15 minutes uh, for them to go through. If you look at just these different types of applications for planning, building, public works and fire, um, what we'd see is that we'd actually have a lot of time saving for our staff. Again, giving those tools to our customers to add their information on their behalf, not having us have to type in their phone number, their names correctly, getting it, get that wrong. 
what we estimate is that if we can get all these customers actually transition to starting their applications on their own, um, we'll save uh, over 3,000 hours of staff time just in the or the um, excuse me the intake appointment process, which we'll talk about a bit more in a second. We also want to give an indication, this is on the far right hand side of this table, of what is the scale for these uh, applications. So, you know, for planning right now, it's about half of their applications will be available to start online with hopes of expanding that um, as we sort of advance their uh, uh, permit application workflows. Public Works is um, making available 91%, so nearly all of theirs, minus some exceptions for the complicated or ones that um, would not make sense for applicants to start on their own. And fire prevention is making available 84%. Um, and they're very interested in making the final sort of 16% available, uh, just need to do some other enhancements to their workflows to make sure customers understand the process. So again, we're, we look forward that this is actually a big accomplishment towards that objective of digital self-service for our customers. Um, and after the testing is complete in the next several weeks, as Chris alluded to, we'll go through the important process of rollout and adoption, making sure that customers have the information that they need to successfully go through this process and minimizing the amount of work our staff will have to do on the back end to fix or correct any errors in their permit applications. And so again, as we said, this is hopefully saving time from the, you know, the appointment intake process. So what we wanna talk about now is that actual appointment, uh, what that appointment process has been. This is actually, again, as a reminder, sort of uh, what our permit center appointments look like today. We presented this at our last uh, presentation to the Smart Cities Committee uh, with phase one and phase two, um, showing what appointments are currently available for customers, both virtual and you know, transitioning back into in-person, and what uh, in, in how this process works today compared to what we're hoping to do in the future. And so on the side, what we see on the left-hand side is just a reminder, building has four main intake, uh, uh, what we call lines, um, the ADU submittal over the counter, plan review service, and fourth, the simple projects. There's an inherent sort of flaw in this structure that again, a customer is allocated a certain amount of time. You can see what our calendars look like in the bottom left-hand side of this slide, that if a customer needs 15 minutes for their appointment intake, because they're all prepared and have no questions, we still need to book an hour for them. And we have about an hour until the next appointment for a customer begins. And this has prevented us for, let's say the really efficient customers from proceeding forward with um, just being able to process their applications as quickly as possible. And I'll give credit to um, our Assistant Director Hugh Chang, who came up with this idea of the rapid online service intake, or what we call ROSI. As Chris mentioned before, this was successfully launched. And again, we would just like to sort of promote and talk about what this process is. It's really for those customers that are best prepared and experienced with ready plans. If they have them available, they book off a similar appointment, but not an appointment that they need to attend or that we actually need to even wait for to begin their process. Customers typically will book out an appointment about a week ahead of time, and our staff are actually about a week, week and a half to actually uh, processing the applications because there's no longer the need to meet. They could actually process them whenever they have the time available. So this is right now limited to plan review intake only. Um, it's again, without structured meetings, and it's just based on the number of available appointments that our staff can actually have based on their availability and not based off you know, the hour available for, or hour and a half available for an appointment. So um, this, these are numbers only through January, um, as well as the last time we pulled this information, but we had 86 successful intakes. We did have about 40 canceled appointments, um, which we expected early on that as customers sort of get used to what the new process is, a lot of them didn't know that they needed to submit at the time and we were ready to process their applications uh, before they were. And so um, we're getting more, um, we're getting more advanced in our understanding and how to communicate this to our customers so they're more prepared for this process. And what we're finding is that where, as in the typical appointment-based system that you see on the left, uh, we're actually able to process about 20% more applications per day than what that fixed time structure allowed for. So again, we're looking to actually expand this process. Um, we're trying to get more customers into the process. We have much greater availability. Customers who book an appointment today will typically hear from our staff uh, within a day or two. And so we're actually trying to get more and more customers familiar and prepared for this process. Um, and at some point, based on sort of the success of this program and expansion, we hope to actually expand it to other virtual um, building service lines. And so before I move on, I just want to uh, huge thanks to a lot of the building team who have been working on this, um, Mace Soon, Dahi, and Keith Faxon, who are uh, leading sort of the building permit center team. And then also uh, a big shout out to Marla Chapman and Lorraine Nunez, who are actually the ones on the ground every day reviewing the applications, working with customers, getting them the right information, and really actually the ones executing on that 20% efficiency bump. So thank you, Marla and uh, Lorraine. 
All right, and for sort of the final update, this is actually revisiting one of the major questions we received from the Smart Cities Committee uh, back in November. And I think it was a very appropriate one about how do we communicate better with our customers? This is a big question we have, especially as we expand the functionalities of extra permits where customers can start their own permit, uh, start their own application online. And so just a couple of updates that we wanted to provide. One is actually a new online guide that we launched in December. It's actually, it's a, a full web page uh, that you can see sort of the hyperlink there at the bottom left that details how a customer can actually find out what the status of their application is, what processes are still open for their application and who they need to contact in case they have any questions. And so it's, um, a, a, it's a, kind of a, a fascinating idea that we, we haven't actually published something like this before. This functionality has been available for a long time. Customers could actually see again, the status and the full history of the applications. But what this hopefully provides for them is, again, giving them one of those digital tools that allow them to find the information themselves and saves what is numerous emails that we get from customers asking about the status of their application. So this has saved our permit center a lot of time and just being able to direct customers to this page so they know how to actually find the information themselves and they don't have to ask us. On the right-hand side of the slide, just wanted to um, highlight a few, or I guess four videos that we've actually already made available. Not all of these recently, but this was a question that came up from the committee at our last presentation. And so, again, as we talked about, videos have been a really effective tool for our customers to understand um, how these processes work, particularly with the new ones. And you can see the first couple of videos, the schedule intake appointment demo, and then uploading project files. Um, ever since COVID, we had a transition to digital file submission. Um, you know, these have been our most viewed, and I think customers have had the most uh, uh, demand for actually seeing how this works, given the, um, the rapid transition to virtual um, uh, process application. We also have more recently uh, launched two new videos uh, trying to teach our customers how to apply for uh, permits online, both the new minor kitchen and bathroom model permit and the sub-trade permit, which is really one of the most common permits available online. The views might not be as high for these videos, but again, if they save you know, these several hundred customers from actually applying in person or trying to take an appointment or saving you know, another email or back and forth a series of emails, um, it's time well sent, uh, spent. And I think we're gonna be using the successes of these, uh, both these resources on this page, the online guide, and of course our video, our online videos, while we prepare for the rollout of the uh, SJ Permits 2.1 start application online. So that concludes all of our project updates. Um, one final update we did want to provide the committee is uh, uh, an update really on our transition of our reporting status. Um, the part uh, tra transformation, development service transformation is a service improvement, of course, for all of our partners. And this, uh, these improvement efforts will start to be reported quarterly to the Community and Economic Development Committee. The initial quarterly reporting, mostly focused on metrics, um, occurred this Monday on February 28th. And the next one will occur on May 23rd, starting that quarterly process. So this will be our final presentation to the Smart Cities Committee, and this information will be presented at that committee meeting. So with that, um, Chris, myself, and representatives from the Development Service Partners are available for any questions. Thank you, Alex and Chris, and, and uh, well done to the whole department. This is really exciting. If you keep innovating like that, we're going to make you come back to this committee because it's very, very much in the... Uh, in line with the mission of our committee. So really, really exciting uh, progress there. Why don't we jump over to public comment and we will go to call in user one. Uh, call in user one, you appear to be muted still. There you go. Hi, yeah, I wanna know difference between a customer and a fee payer or a taxpayer. Customer means you could go someplace else, but you have to deal with the city. It's the only game in town. So, you know, I don't feel like a customer when I have to go pay a fee or a fine at a city. I feel like a fee payer or a rate payer or a taxpayer. So the word customer to me is a bit odd, almost Orwellian in a way. Like you guys are a private company and you're going to make money off of people? Uh, I don't know. I just know that this city needs to have better service, be better uh, attitudes from the people if you're going to have to go pay all this money. And what are people really getting? I mean, look at these guys who own these pot stores. They're getting robbed all the time, and they're paying out lots of fees, lots of taxes. I just hope the money's all going to the right, to the right places. 
because we don't have enough money for police or fire. It takes an hour for a cop to come out, 15 minutes for the fire department. What are people paying for? That's what I want to know. But I'm not allowed to ask questions, right, because everything is regulated by by this two minutes. But uh, it looks like you guys aren't cutting me off today, which is nice. Usually you guys can't handle it, so you hang up the phone because you don't want to have to hear it. But that's why there's public comment. Not like it's going to change your mind. But you guys need to know how the people feel in this city about what they're paying for and what they're not getting. And I know you guys hate to hear it because you're on, you're on your pedestal. I mean, you guys are going to save Ukraine. I mean, you guys are going to make sure that uh, people in Mississippi can come here to get abortions. I mean, you guys are saving the world. But, you know, when I call up, you guys realize you're not. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Let's come back to the committee. Just a reminder, we want to ask people to stay on topic, but we will cut off comments. Thank you. Okay, thanks for the, uh, the great report, Chu. I, I love the idea for the um, Rosie, I think the system was called. I think that's really exciting. 20% efficiency gain is, uh, is pretty exciting. I'm going to hand it over to Vice Mayor Jones, and then I may have a couple of follow-up questions. Go ahead, Vice Mayor. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And uh... I agree. Um, great report. And we're making a lot of positive progress. Um, I have a question about the rapid online service intake. Um, it was stated that the best prepared experienced uh, applications were the ones that were able to make it through the, uh, the process. Can you give me a better understanding of the strategy around, you know, taking applicants or applications from folks who aren't as experienced or aren't as prepared and getting them trained up to, to be able to go through the process rapidly and efficiently? Yes, maybe I can take on that one. Thank you, Vice Mayor Jones. Uh, where is this concept coming from? Through the COVID the last two years, we do virtual service. We found out pretty soon our entire intake service backlog all the way to three months, four months even. Because we have every single appointment need to spend about 90 minutes to hand-holding a lot of customers, single family homeowner, they're not used to apply the permit. They're doing permit application themselves. In a way, they become a bottlenecks. Then we start hearing a lot of more professional developer, designer, contractor. Their voices, what we heard is, you know, we are ready, but we don't get a appointment for like two months out. So we start thinking about, okay, how are we going to serve that different type of needs or customers in need to make them both work? How we utilize our staff, we are, we are very short of staff. Well, right? so many people retire, so many people move out. Mm -hmm. But we have very limited resource, how we best utilize the resources we can, because we know we can't even find more people. It takes a long process to find. So we have to better use our resource to serve different type. So we start thinking, OK, why we don't just separate the two groups? We hear the voice for the professional developer, applicant, contractor, designer. They know how. They don't need to be hand-holding them through each appointment. They are ready. They've done that before. So we separate the line out. So we still keep another two line to support people not quite know, never done this before. We still spend 90 minutes each permit center team hand holding guidance through. Our goal is the more we continue the virtual portion, more people begin to understand. Because I have to confess, there are so many documents we needed, so many information we needed. Once they hopefully they've done that once or twice or even three times already. They become eventually, they can do the ROSI program. The ROSI program, we don't talk, we don't need because customers know exactly what they need to supply, to give to us. The plan, how they, they know how to upload the plan. They know what's the information we have. We have a checklist there. They fill out every information we need on the one page. So our permit center staff can just walk behind the thing, one after another one, one after another one. So we don't lock our self time into the 90 minutes anymore. So hopefully another few months, we can move more of the customer into the ROSI. But remember, as I said earlier, we don't have more staff. So as, as long as we're gonna start seeing ROSI line begin to have in backlog, 
because that means more people know how to do this. We can't keep up the demand anymore. Hopefully, we also have less people go to our regular virtual line. So we're gonna start moving step from the virtual line, coming back more step into the rosy line. Like Alice mentioned earlier, we only have two people assigned. One is a supervisor, just pre-screening every rosy application. Another step just behind the scene, keep processing. We have another four step into another two line. Hopefully we can keep moving people from the other virtual line into the rosy line so we can keep this uh, process going. So in a way, we train the people more familiar with our process. We serve the people already know how to do it. So that's our approach for now. So I, I don't know I answer your question exactly. Uh, no, you did answer my question. Uh, just kind of a follow-up to that. And I, I totally understand the resource constraints and resource allocation issues that the, your department has. Um, but you did mention the the experience, you know, contractors who, you know, repeatedly use the service, you know, that's pretty straightforward. Yes. For the for the, you know, infrequent or hardly ever users, like mm -hmm. I might only, you know, need a permit like once every 10 years. Correct. And, and if and I know that you said that, you know, it takes about 90 minutes to work with someone like me who doesn't you know, isn't familiar with the process. Maybe 60 minutes for you, but. Well, 60 minutes, <laughs> maybe like three hours, but <laughs> anyway, um, just wanna um, throw this out there for, mm -hmm. you know, consideration is, sure, you so. know, there's gonna be um, applicants who are gonna need, you know, a lot of handholding, high touch, there's going to be some who are just completely self-sufficient. And then you, there's a, a middle group. And I actually put myself in that middle group who, if there was a quality tutorial or an online, you know, checklist mm -hmm. that I can go to first yes. before I enter into the process, that might be, a, you know, one strategy for that, that right. segmentation or, or group that, you know, all they just need is a little you know, a YouTube video just to get educated on the process and then go through the process. So I just Thank want you. to throw that out there as a- Yep, great, great idea. Thank you. I think YouTube probably is good. We probably can do more outreach on the ROSI program, but I will put answer this different way. If you want to do ROSI, even you are not sure, if you enter the ROSI, you will see the checklist. Because the checklist is not just a checklist, it's every box you have to fill in the information. That's how it takes time. You should. But if, if beginning, we were joking sort of like three strike you out. If you fail this ROSI program twice, we're going to kick you out back to the 90 minutes appointment. Our staff actually don't do that. In a way, they still give people a chance because it, it from the beginning, even professional, maybe still misses something or did the timing of upload the plan, maybe they are wrong. So we give people plenty of, our goal is we can process from here as fast as we can. Yeah, the information is out, gonna be out there. Either ver verbally, virtually, we guide them through, or once you come to the ROZ, you will know exactly what information we need. Once you fill that in, our staff will take the information behind the scene, process it, they will let you know permits ready to move on to the plan review. So the intake is complete. So things are gonna start moving. So thank you. Yeah, we definitely, I can ask help from Alex. Maybe Alex can help us do another video. Awesome. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. It, true, just great questions, by the way, and comments from the Vice Mayor. Just to confirm, the efficiency gain that you got primarily came from sort of disaggregating applications or appointments that have different levels of complexity so that you could quickly and efficiently process the ones that are ready to go faster, like a 15 minute review versus the ones that take the 90 minutes. You basically have just split it into two queues so that you can better apportion your staff time to go through. Right. And we have right. not, we've not actually de-resourced or, or slowed down the folks who need 90 minutes. Is that right? Correct, correct. Great. Right. We've just gotten efficiencies case. by putting all the short ones, small ones together and stacked them back to back. Right, because think about even the professional gave an entire filling the form to information we need. Probably yeah. staff still need to enter every single one. Right. I watched it and one, one time I don't even believe even just strictly enter the 
information. That's a 20 some minute just without even talking, just yeah. enter. Yeah, that's not a good use of anyone's home. time. Yeah, just, yeah, but if we do virtual become Q&A, what is the square footage? What is this? What is that? What's the type? Da, da, da. So all that conversation, plus people may not prepare well. So that's the 90 minutes of time we spend for that type of customer. Yeah. That's excellent. Oh, yeah, that's really exciting. Just a couple of quick questions on the, uh, the, the, the permit application process, the, the first of the, the three that you went through there. Um, is the goal that all planning and building permits will be supported online, at least as far in as you can go, essentially? Will they all originate online in the future? Uh, I will answer first. Maybe Alice can definitely help. I want to make it clear that I think sometimes we maybe not explain well. There are two types when we say online. Building has a 30-some project permit type. That's online, but it does not go through the intake. Customer directly go online, pull permit, permit issue on the spot. That I think a balance you call the self uh, the administrative permit. That doesn't even need to come to our portal. That we make through portal in a way, but online that way. But Alice's presentation later part is now not online permit available, but it's more online intake. Can I say it that way, Alex? In a way. So uh, yeah, we contrast self-administered versus self-started. And what we were yeah, presenting on was just self-starting. Exactly. Okay. Maybe, sorry, I was uh, I interrupted. Go ahead. Um, no, I'll continue. I, that was a great shoe. Um, so yeah, the, the objective, I think, is to move as many as possible to be self-started. I'd say, I think where she was going to is we also want to continue to expand the self-administered as well, where we have enough confidence that customers can actually pull and can uh, construct sort of without that plan review or, you know, human touch aspect. Um, we also want to build, we want to sort of expand that pie of the self-administered. For um, building, we're getting we're getting there. You saw Public Works and Fire much more successful. Um, planning obviously has a lot of um, discretionary applications, a lot of applications that are usually led by uh, single family homeowners that oftentimes could apply for the wrong application. If we get too many customers applying for the wrong application type, um, then we'll spend more time having to contact them, cancel, and then just recreating the process, which could take more time for staff. So an easy example that we typically give for this is our true removal process. Um, oftentimes homeowners are trying to figure out if they're dead or alive, and it's oftentimes not, not clear for them sort of which application they need to apply for, and usually it needs like an arborist, which doesn't come in until later in the process. So for those, we still want staff to sort of help guide them to the right point, because we can't just sort of flip a switch between the two, the fees and everything would be calculated differently. So where we can, I think that might be a, a complex example, but really that might be where the, um, the limitation is right now is how do we get customers more comfortable and confident applying for a greater portion of the applications. Right, right. And I, I assume you can kind of um, create, do some kind of creation wizard up front that would help do a lot of routing, but you're saying in some cases you still, it's still more efficient to have a human actually interview someone. Uh, Yes, often well, for some application types, it may be, um, but I'm glad that you brought up the wizard. Uh, it was actually a, a point on Chris's slide that he didn't mention that the wizard is actually what we're calling phase 2.11 uh, is the next phase. So actually we are intending to create that after we get this launch. The wizard itself, uh, the, the phasing of the two obviously was a little bit of a, comp, um, a difficult decision, but without the ability to start applications online, the wizard wouldn't really lead anywhere. So that's the next phase. We've actually mostly finished the requirements and the vendor could start once development's complete, but really wanna make sure resources are available. Um, the wizard would be a key resource that we hope to create um, sometime during the summer. Yeah, that makes sense to me. That's exciting. Um, how are you doing user testing? I, you, know, you, you did the demo, of course, for the demo, it always goes very smoothly, but uh, when it's out in the wild, as you point out, it gets, it gets more complicated for folks. Are we, are we actually doing proper user testing or watching people go through it who have just you know, have an intention, but don't have the context that we have. It's a good question, and this uh, was actually something I brought up at the uh, at the last Smart Cities Committee meeting. Um, right now, of course, we're still actually in just our. It's not quite smoke testing yet, but it's really our subject matter experts who are testing. In the next couple of weeks, we actually want to test with more of our internal users. And again, they won't be the ones applying online, but they'll be the ones who are addressing the questions that they get every day from customers. And so that will be sort of the next phase. What we did in the initial launch of SJ Permits 2.0 is that we started reaching out to customers that we've had good relationships that use the portal a lot to get their sense of how this uh, could work. Um, what we've done in the way past is with the previous improvements to our portal, uh, we would find customers waiting to get a permit in person in the permit center and try to show them how they could do it online with the new portal. 
Um, that's usually the best opportunity because that would give us access to the customers who don't know the resource exists, has never used it before. And again, I think as you're implying, would give us the greatest access to see how they're using it sort of over their shoulder. Um, oftentimes those customers can be hard to find. So that'll be a little bit dependent on um, uh, greater access, I think, to City Hall and more customers coming in person. Um, but at the very least, we could reach out to customers that are applying online and see if we can get some feedback from, from them. Cool. Yeah, I think that's really important. And if I recall correctly from my days doing software development, there was even some services that would anonymize who the user was, but allow you to basically record uh, sessions on a screen and see where the drop off is, see where the lag is, see where people are clicking on the screen, sort of just, you know, we, we would watch videos of hundreds and hundreds of interactions of people going through a flow and kind of see where, where they abandon the flow, where they spend a lot of time thinking, where they're typing and erasing, and, and you obviously want to have all the, you know, use vet that software. I'm sure we'll go through a lengthy procurement process if you want to do that and, and make sure it protects user privacy. But I think there are ways to really get a, a very, uh, you know, honest, unfiltered view of how people are actually use, going through a, a software enabled flow. So I think that would at least be worth looking at if it isn't um, too complicated. And, um, and then I wanted to ask one other, um, one other question here, this will be my last one. The I noticed in 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 depth the details, I think it was the last stop in the flow that you presented on your slides. There, there was a note there that if I read correctly said something like uh, even a basic single family home alteration can require over 150 individual pieces of information. And um, obviously not something we should be um, proud of, though I'm sure that is the reality. I, I, what I want to know is, are there ways to automate the collection of any of that data? Or do, do, we, do we absolutely need all of it? I mean, the more fields we have, the more frustration and the more drop off we'll have. That's just like an ironclad law of consumer product design. So how do we reduce the number of fields people have to actually fill in? Can, have you examined that question? I, I can start, but uh, I think I'd love to hear Chu's response. Um, I would say for a lot of this, it's you know fields that have existed over a long period of time. That that example is the um, is the residential permit for for building. There's a lot of fields. It's a um, what we call it a, a folder type or a type of permit, I guess, in our system that has existed for 20 years. And so over 20 years, you know, the different fields that we've prioritized, that we've asked that customers, or more importantly, I guess, our staff to make sure that are entered, that are populated, so we can report and measure the various priorities. I think most recently, you know, that the next recent uh, field, the mo I think the most recent field edition we've had is uh, SB9 applications. Can we identify that in the portal? So it's not something we can automate based on geographic information, uh, but something that's based on the application type that, again, we can ask customers to populate, um, but right now we're sort of asking our staff to um, to enter in all those fields. So it it is a little bit of the, um, uh, I, I think we, we always identify it as it's one more thing that our staff need to do, and we know it's going to be a big issue with uh, customers as well. I would say one of the, the one, one aspect that will alleviate for customers is that not all information needs to be there initially, and then some of the questions might be too complicated for them. So we know that staff will still need to do some data entry themselves, uh, but identifying fields to remove is, um, is a good opportunity for, I think, streamlining uh, both our, our input and as well as the customer. Okay, uh, maybe I will try to answer in maybe two different ways. Why we need so many data? I can sometimes, maybe just my perspective, we become a slave of the data because we want a lot of data. Every data we want to collect, every single thing we want to sort it out, we will need to ask customer. So sometimes we do want to ask, because keep in mind, building permit process always is not just a building. We building permit center a lot of times is a gatekeeper for housing, economic development, for fire, for public works, for every single department. They all have different perspective. They want to know more. Are we doing ADU? Is ADU also doing remodel? If remodel doing addition or remodel just attach or detach, there's so many information we have to sort it out because we want to so detailed data. Uh, question become. Are we asking so many information data because the burden is in you know, the processing time? Another part that I look at it is it's become regulation, regu regulatory side. Are we asking too much? Are we trying to safeguard every possible violation of the law? Because I have that conversation with our staff. Okay, state contracting 
laws require this, this, this. Are you the owner? Are you the applicant? Are you the representative? Who can sign? Who cannot sign? Do you have a business license? Do you? That's another whole side of thing. Sometimes I ask ourselves, say, what if they cheat? They lie? How many make a mistake? So what? Maybe that's just another good question as a cell because we ask a lot of things because mm -hmm. I want to make sure nobody violate every law state ever created, every department requirement have to check. Or we just become honor, honorary system. We spelled it out. Hey, you need to follow this or you will have a consequence, but I'm not going to ask you more detail. You don't have to do, sometimes my, my complaint ourselves is, at the end, before we issue a permit, and how many signatures we're gonna get? The owner, owner representative, the contractor, everybody all have to sign the dotted line. Just find all the signatures together, but it take a week sometime. Now becomes, so who is the only one person, entity or developer can just responsible for that one page of permit when we issue? Well, we really need 10 signatures on the top. It's a good question in a way, but we, we internally, we certainly want to look into it. If they don't pay business tax, for example, why building permit care? But we want to make sure they go to the finance, you must pay the business tax. Yeah. Did they go to environmental service, clear their city? Did they go to every department? So, but that's just the nature of our permit. That's why it takes so long. And also yeah. why the information is so much. No, and I, I understand that. I'm glad you're asking these questions. I just, um, I think it's always easier to add more fields, uh -huh. but I think we also know that the, the products we all love, the, 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 the services that give us a good experience and make us want to come back and feel good about where we're spending our time and money are the simple ones. You know, it's Apple exactly. getting the phone down to having one button, right? Or right. no buttons now. Uh -huh. You know, it's, it's the simplification. We're never, we're never going to be Apple, but I just, you know, would encourage exactly. us to really always ask that question. Can we, can we do it more simply? And I guess part of what was buried in my question, and then I'll, we, we will wrap up, is just um, are there opportunities to use data sources we have? And, and this is maybe a question for Rob long-term that's kind of crazy pie in the sky thinking, but you know, I filled out a bunch of forms to, to uh, plant a tree in my park strip. Can we create a um, a resident profile that might allow me when I come back to the city website to not have to fill out all of my basic information again, because maybe the city could recognize that I am a homeowner at a given address. And therefore the pages I filled out to do one thing might be, uh, you know, usable again and, and be able to be pulled into another form when I need to uh, submit a permit to put on a solar panel or whatever it might be, you know, can we create user profiles that would allow residents to kind of maintain data so that we're not constantly filling out forms over and over again anyway well, I, okay I, I believe that's already building alex the portal right once you once you register your account your basic information is there already you don't have to re-enter another time when you pull another permit uh correct you and i'll just add uh, my information was there my name was on there and it behind the scenes had all the information i've entered my phone number email that i would because i that's could great. come back to apply there's actually another row there that actually populated the property owner information as well. It's information we need no matter what. And that's an automation we've had with data that we actually work with the county on maintaining, or I guess we received from the county. So um, that's also information that's populated that we need as part of our process. So the, those are some aspects we didn't um, show in the demo, but it was, it oh, was there. Yeah. That's why I was asking about automation. That's great. I'm glad to hear you are pulling in some of that data. Okay, great. Sorry, we belabored that point a bit. Do we wanna, oh, Rob, go ahead. Yeah, and, and uh, Chair uh, Mahan, Rob Lloyd, uh, WC Manager. Um, so we do do that in the specialized business applications where you have personalization in that profile. Um, you're thinking more advanced though, I think where you're saying for all city services and bringing that across. It is, and it shows your experience, um, but uh, it is on our roadmap. Uh, it's quite a few levels down. There's other things we need to mature up, um, but it is an ambition of ours long-term to get to that personalization and to not ha have to um, recreate yourself for each city service. Right, right, cool. I'm glad to hear it's somewhere out there on the roadmap one day, that would be pretty cool. Okay, can we entertain a motion here? So moved. Second. Thank you, great. Let's vote. Jones? Aye. Foley? Aye. Cohen? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. Okay, we are on to our third and final item. And I believe we are, is this our 
information technology report, productivity uh, software usability status report, excuse me. Correct, Chair. Uh, Rob Lloyd, Deputy City Manager. So as usage of productivity and collaboration technologies um, emerged in the COVID uh, pandemic and became crucial to how our hybrid teams uh, work and identify and resolving those usability issues that people have experienced um, have actually become more important. Uh, the dynamic use of, of these technologies is whether or not teams can work together on a day-to-day -day basis and in the flow of, of the work that hits them. So at Council's request, we did commit to coming back on this item and some of the usability uh, issues that Council had expressed when we did the contract renewal. Uh, and we've had some work that we've done with each of your offices, as well as some departments, on what those usability needs are and uh, created a list, uh, also created some other resources. And to address that, we have Ed Kim, Deputy Chief Information Officer, Ashish Lakiani, IT Products Projects Manager, uh, who actually led most of the work, and Amanda Lay, um, our Enterprise Projects Lead. And they're gonna present the work that was done, but also receive more feedback from Council. And with that, uh, Ed. Uh, we'll oh, do actually, actually goes to Ashish. It goes to Ashish, yeah. Ashish, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, I wanna confirm if the slide is visible on the screen. Can I get a thumbs up from somebody? Thank you, Rob. So good afternoon, Chairperson Mahan, members of the committee, city staff, and members of the public. I am Ashish Lakhiani, Products Projects Manager at the Information Technology Department. Happy to take you all through this status update on Microsoft usability. Productivity and collaboration tools are critical to staff based on the city's hybrid work plans and customer input. City staff use these tools for email, calendar and appointments management, word processing, spreadsheets, presentations, voice video communication, document collaboration, saving and searching for documents. Our city has a contract with Microsoft that spans five years from 2021 to 2026. This is a cooperative purchase using the County of Riverside, California contract for Microsoft Enterprise License Agreement. The city IT team and Microsoft built usability objectives and key results for, for, for the productivity and collaboration tools. They're based on what we hear from our users who want to share document edits on the fly, share information, chat with each other, and trust that the tools are secure. The tools work well and allow users to collaborate with ease. However, a few gaps were identified for which improvements have been made and planned. With the city's Microsoft Office 365 contract renewal, Microsoft and the city agreed to allocate 1,200 professional services hours to address needs for increased adoption at no additional cost. ID department used these hours to work with dedicated support engineers and 25 city departments and offices to analyze usability issues, identify root causes. Issues, causes, and resolutions were categorized by theme based on information from help desk tickets and problem solving sessions. Overall, usage of Microsoft Office 365 has increased substantially over the past two years. The collaboration and information sharing capabilities of Microsoft Office 365 support day to day work of staff at every level. In the fall 2021 ID customer survey, City staff rated Microsoft Office services and support at 93% good to excellent, and SharePoint and OneDrive at 88% good to excellent. Based on collected data, the usage of SharePoint has been steadily increasing across city departments. Use of SharePoint increased approximately 50% over the last six months. Still, there have been recurring usability cases centering on Outlook performance, computer performance, and calendaring issues. From the study sessions conducted and information gathered, staff focused on council district offices and the mayor's office where specialized needs were identified due to non-standard work patterns. 67 problem tickets were identified and analyzed that summarized into 23 problem types and three usability themes which are Outlook performance, computer and devices performance, and calendaring performance. Under Outlook performance, some key issues faced are emails getting stuck in the outbox and users thinking that they're sent and loss of the Zoom plugin. Under the computer and devices performance theme, 
Key issues are users want to install more mobile apps than those which are offered by default and slow computer performance. Under calendaring performance, the key issue faced is inconsistent calendar sync on computer and mobile devices for some heavy calendar users that have a lot of calendar events. ID department analyzed end user devices to realize that Outlook performance and calendaring performance issues are resolved by keeping end user systems updated. Computer performance issues are resolved by replacing aging computers. 28 computers were updated in response to the findings and seven more are in process to be replaced. We have designed and will be implementing a standards-based lifecycle management process for Microsoft Windows and Office 365 that will keep all desktops, laptops, and mobile devices updated citywide based on recommendations from Microsoft. Microsoft does not support Apple's native calendar and mail app. Although users face issues with Outlook device and calendaring performance, these issues have not hindered their usage of SharePoint. Calendar sync improvements are ongoing. We updated Outlook versions of the calendar owners and calendar delegates that are running into this issue. As a result, this has decreased the occurrence of sync issues that are ongoing. There are ongoing conversations with Microsoft for a permanent and more consistent resolution. A trend noticed is that the issue occurs with users that have greater than 50,000 events on their calendars over a period of time. Microsoft suggested archival of older events to boost performance. ID department and Microsoft are considering a possible change in archival settings, along with records retention, reporting, and search impacts. As continuing efforts, ID department will be implementing an on-demand learning solution for training in response to five departments that have specifically requested easy to consume training materials. ID department staff will assist end users to install and use Microsoft applications on compatible devices. We will measure reduction of calendar sync issues based on help test tickets and implement recommendations suggested by Microsoft. Staff has appreciated the temporary chat support line, allowing them to quickly get assistance from help desk staff. While the tool is not sustainable as the four staff members providing the chat support service must cover cases from about 3,000 employees, there are technologies that better use chat capabilities for questions and resolutions. As the temporary chat line is closed and the one-time Microsoft engineering hours are depleted, ID department will examine options and their potential impacts on case res response and customer satisfaction. Here's an example of productivity and collaboration tools in use. Shown on the screen is a capture of the daily information systems and development stand-up meeting running on Teams from Department of Transportation. Using collaboration tools, this team is productive in a hybrid work environment. I'm thankful to Vince Pereira from Department of Transportation IT for providing this to us. All cameras are on, many people are smiling, and most have their eyes open. All of the work carried out and that planned ahead is not possible without efforts of city staff and Microsoft team members. Thank you to staff and vendor team members shown on the screen and the teams that they work with. Also, thank you to all of those who allowed me to share the pictures and were a little less shy. All right, so thank you for listening to the status report, chairperson, members of the committee, city staff, and members of the public opening it up to questions and comments, and I'm handing the ball back to Chairperson uh, Mahan. Thank you, Ashish, and I wanna, I wanna thank our staff and our partners at Microsoft for working collaboratively uh, to optimize our systems and, and enable our, our team to be as productive as possible. Uh, we'll come back to the committee in a moment. Let's go to public comment. It looks like we will start with Blair. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Uh, thanks for the meeting today. Hopefully uh, I can just offer a simple reminder uh, of the important work of uh, uh, AI practices that, that you've been developing uh, from this past fall. It was uh, new concepts of uh, civil protection ideas that, uh, and just a whole new uh, wave of uh, 
AI questions yourselves were having that uh, just to mention to, at this time and as a reminder of uh, its importance to all of us and how to create those good practices based on civil protection ideas, uh, you know, among other things, uh, good luck in that work and those continuing good efforts. Uh, I think it can be applicable possibly to the previous item as well. And uh, just wanted to mention it. And uh, as we're heading into a new AI era at this time, uh, good luck to yourselves and really- so This is on the Microsoft tools? Specifically? Yeah, I'm sorry if I'm off a bit. I just thought I would offer a generalized uh, description of things. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate that. Thanks, Blair. Okay, let's come back to the committee. Great, and do my colleagues have any questions or comments? Okay, I have one kind of general question. Um, I, I saw email and calendar emphasized there. Have we um, surfaced, I know we'd had a couple of issues last year with um, some of the uh, collaborative docs on, on web uh, might have been, I think my team at least was using Chrome. I'm just curious if, if we looked into our use of um, OneNote or shared uh, Microsoft Word when, when web-based, multiple people using it at the same time. Was that, did that make it onto the, the, the docket, if you will, for, um, sort of assessing performance, or, or was that kind of below the line? Yeah, I can take that one. Uh, we have a few. I think uh, what you're referring to is collaborative uh, document sync issues. Uh, yeah. There, there haven't been a lot of occurrences of that. The, for the few that did occur, uh, I think the theme is is uh, consistent with uh, keeping your client updated. So keeping the 365 client suite updated is not just Outlook. It has uh, Word and Excel, uh, the other applications all uh, combined in that process. We do notice that sometimes there's a, a little ribbon that appears on the top of some browsers, uh, windows that uh, on the screen which says you have, there's a version clash. And many a times that is associated with uh, the person's internet connection flickering at where they're working from. So in, in some cases we've been able to update and resolve and in other cases we've been asked, we ask people to just make sure they're well connected and pay attention to the, to the uh, clash message that appears. And, and Terry, let me add on to that. We, we do actually have some support tickets um, that hit the help desk on that one. And it, it's not consistent, um, but we do need to keep working with Microsoft on that one. That ribbon error uh, does come up for people working even in city hall. Um, where sometimes we have three or four more or more people working on a document, it happens more often. Um, so that's still on our list, uh, just to be frank and candid. Yeah, great. I'm glad to hear that's still on, on the list. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Cohen. Yeah, thank you. And I wanted to thank staff for the presentation and also for the, um, the work that's been done to try to improve the user experience. Although I have felt pretty comfortable with the experience we've had so far. Um, I know that there have been some people who have some concerns. Um, the only thing I still have concerns with is the uh, calendar sync between devices. So appreciate that you're still working on that. I did want to ask a question. There's been some talk about search um, and how easy it is to find things in Outlook. I, I don't necessarily have that problem, but I'm trying to understand what are the concerns people have and are there real issues or is it just a lack of training? Well, actually, let me handle this one first, Ashish, and then uh, have you do the follow-up. Is uh, We have two different types of cases. It didn't come up as much in usability, but we do see tickets for Council Member Cohen um, in general, where people said, hey, um, I seem to not be seeing certain emails that used to be in my inbox because there was a change that beyond a year or two, wherever the default setting is, you don't see them, and then you have to search for emails. So that was one type of question we received. And then num number two is... Um, sometimes a search is done and it's not rendering against the, the mailbox. We, we do have some, uh, some cases around that. And then you exit and you come back in and the search is fine. Um, so, so we do have some of those, but they're very uh, random and, and rare. Uh, and so troubleshooting them hasn't been as consistent. But the number one advice we have is if you exit a previous search and go back to your inbox uh, and re-render the search, for the most part, people have been able to successfully find some things. Third, uh, on your comment, though, is there sometimes is training where um, you know, we can give some Boolean terms and, and teach people how to do quotation marks and and comments to find things more easily, because <laughs> we do have some employees with 20 to 30 years worth of email, 
Um, and when, when you get to have that large a corpus of emails in, in your mailbox, um, some of the search tools and using the advanced find features, um, they're not as commonly used. So we do have to coach people through those. Um, but there, there are some, some various types of search questions that come up in our, uh, in our tickets. Does that answer your question though? Yeah, yeah, that answers my question. I mean, I, I think people are used to the Google search and what's in Gmail, which is, I mean, it, it's, a, it's sort of the gold standard. So maybe that's part of the issue people are having. Um, it's, it's hard to using Outlook to do as well, as good of a search, I think. But I think setting that aside, it, it's been pretty effective. Um, one of the other questions I have is about exiting and re-entering Outlook, I guess people, there's often a time where, where it doesn't update, you don't get your, you don't get your messages downloaded, for example, and I think um, people have to be reminded to restart their computer periodically to exit out of Outlook and reopen it, because I, that, I find that that's, that solves many of the problems that happen. Um, so anyway, I just want to say that I do, I do like the Teams interface uh, very, very much, um, and kind of, wish internally we would standardize more on, on using Teams, especially because of the chat features, which I think are very helpful for staff. And I find that many people in, in the in, internally in the city are not necessarily on the chat uh, or using the chat. And maybe we ought to do some additional um, standardization to try to gain some value from some of these features. Is that something you're thinking about? Yeah, we do have a new um, lead enterprise technology manager for our collaboration and productivity team. Uh, and they're setting their OKRs, and one of them is standardizing more around Teams because it brings together the various pieces into one place. And, and as you allude to, it's simpler to process when you're not having the channel switch um, into the Outlook app uh, to the calendar piece. Um, and then you see the little trigger buttons, right? As if you have a calendar and you can jo uh, directly join the Teams session, um, you can do the search. And, and so it all just comes together in one place. It is part of our plans to do more centralizing of our services and do more training around Teams adoption. Uh, and Microsoft is always glad to hear that. We also have, to be honest, some, some cleanup and some continued, continued adoption around SharePoint and OneDrive and some consistency there so that teams actually are consistent enough to be able to use that, those remote um, access tools to information um, more consistently and without issue. And so there is some investment that we're going to be making, and it's in, in the memo as well around the training piece of this, um, because the more consistent we can get, the better our hybrid workforce will have an experience. Um, but the Teams is at the center of our productivity and collaboration work. Okay. Of course, I'm only making these comments because my friends Jonathan and Paul are on the call who are listening in. But, but I'll, I'll let you know after offline what I really think of the product. <laughs> but anyway, no, thank you for the update. <laughs> they are good people. <laughs> well, now that that's been disclosed. Um, no, thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Okay, excellent. I think we're on to the Vice Mayor. Thank you, Chair. Um, why not throw a little hand grenade into the, the conversation and that is about uh, supporting Max. I know officially uh, Max aren't a supported platform. Is there a, a plan to change that? Um, our, our plan is to change your mind. Um, <laughs> and, and, and part of that, sorry, uh, Rob Lloyd, Deputy City Manager. Um, uh, Vice Mayor, one of the things that we really need to do, uh, two things actually are related is one is to ensure that personal devices are no longer touching the city network because of some direction we got from our uh, insurance companies and, and auditors, uh, cybersecurity auditors. So um, personal Apple devices, um, we, we actually have to have much more protections on. And number two is the ability to support Apple uh, with four people supporting 3000. We try to keep the portfolio as clean as we can um, fortunately, um, you know, we've been able to kind of turn a blind eye towards our Apple users because they've been largely self-sufficient, but where there's some interoperability issues that come up, um, and, and you've experienced this, is like, can we convince you to use the, <laughs> the Windows device? So that, that's our first uh, strategy is to try to convince you how um, uh, coming along and being part of the pack is, is, uh, is the better path. But where that's not possible, like with Councilmember Foley, who just raised her hand, uh, <laughs> um, we we will work with you. But um, the, the better strategy is to try to be very consistent, clean, um, and uh, to make sure all our tools are working in the same way. And so I, I was guessing that you, you and Councilmember Foley might give us an alternate opinion. 
I am well, also I'm, of the I'll, alternate I'll, opinion. Go, sorry, Vice Mayor, go oh, ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, you know, once you go Mac, you never go back. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say Matt or Mac? <laughs> Mac. <laughs> I, I can't speak for Matt. For Mac. I'm, yes, I'm Mac. dialing in from a MacBook Pro. All right, uh, Councilmember Foley. Well, I'm so glad, I'm so glad the Vice Mayor raised my issues. A absolutely, uh, support for Macs, and I'm sitting here with one, two, three, four Mac devices. So uh, you're saying we're self-sufficient. This Mac user isn't necessarily. I depend on the kindness of strangers <laughs> to, to help me out uh, completely. So um, I'm wondering if Mac users, this one in particular, can get some training in, we, in connection with Teams and, and uh, other Microsoft products, because frankly, I'm not a huge fan. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Mac products and that's what I know. And even then my staff will tell you, I don't know those very well, but at least I can navigate what I need to. But when you convert and everything is on Microsoft now or access is through Microsoft, it becomes very difficult for someone like me. And I can't be the only one around city staff that this is difficult for. I know city staff is using not Mac products and, and I have the flexibility to use my Mac products, but how can you help someone like me and then others at the city to uh, get some training when we have a device that may not be the city or city issued? Uh, and uh, Councilmember uh, Foley, uh, Rob Lloyd, Deputy City Manager, the um, three things on that one is I still remember from um, the IT strategic planning input, your words to me is you'll take my Apple devices out of my cold, dead hands. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I understand how, how uh, powerful you feel about this one. Uh, number two is uh, we do see the number one issue that, that has come across that we haven't been able to fix. And, and Microsoft um, has a long development relationship with Apple. But there is um, a problem between the native Microsoft, um, sorry, the native Apple calendaring and how it reads the Microsoft calendar. And you'll see that in calendars falling out of sync and all of you have expressed that experience. Until Microsoft and Apple actually can uh, agree on fixing that, that's one where we're powerless. Um, we have no ways to actually fix that because that's two major vendors and, a, and very popular products used by hundreds of millions of people. Um, they're not connecting quite right. And, and Apple can speak to that, or, and so can our friends at, um, uh, from Microsoft who are here today. Number three is um, the answer, the true answer to your question is we, we have proposed in the past um, a specialized IT support person for um, our electeds and um, our, our 17th floor people, the people who have to be in meetings and if something goes wrong, they can't participate in a public meeting. Um, uh, the decision-making um, of the city is, gets impaired so that we can actually plan out and support those things um, with, with some more energy and focus, like the, the person's actually there to, to plan and take care of things, as well as some of the CRM and, and, um, and web application and, and uh, communications technologies that you use that other offices don't as much. And so the only answer I have for you is if, if the resources are there, we'll propose that again and, and say, can we get some focused support to do that and, and on the side we'll do more training um, so we do have a training resource and microsoft and us have paired up on uh, making one available we're going to test if these training resources and in, in smaller bites um, you can get the videos can support the questions that do come up but um, unfortunately on the, the apple and microsoft there there are a few things where um, the kind of the price of admission is they don't work as well together as using the same product um, everyone using the same product but let me put it that way I understand. So, how long will it take us to convert everybody to Mac products? <laughs> uh, no, no comment. <laughs> One other thing, uh, Rob, and I love that you introduce yourself every time you speak. It's, it's we know who you are. Um, <laughs> Sorry. But, one other thing you said something about more protections for private devices. That is that a cyber security thing that you prefer not discussing right now, and maybe we can talk about it offline. Uh, actually, we can talk about this one, and, and I'll draw the line if, if we get into some something that's more secure and critical infrastructure. But okay. uh, yeah, one of the uh, great uh, the important guidance things there's there's two main things that have the highest level of protection. One is the use of multi-factor authentication, where you log in and, and there's a number um, that that um, is required to type in, and we know it's you. 
Number two is to keep your environment clean and high hygiene without using any personal devices. When you're allowed to use personal devices on a corporate network, it is one of the main vectors for, for bad things to get in. Some people are clean, it's the ones that aren't that then bring um, stuff that imperils the entire environment directly into the, the city's computer operating environment. And so both of those are rules that the city has. Um, in, in certain cases, um, we have specialized exceptions, but then we have to work with you to make sure that um, your computers are clean, you have the intrusion detection, you have the anti-malware, and all those things are checked off for that device to say it's mitigated and can be on the city network. Okay, great, thank you. And finally, I'll, I'll just say this uh, was a really good presentation. Ashish, I loved your presentation and your sense of humor. And thank you, Amanda and Ed, for all of your work on this. Thank you, Council Member. Yes, I'll echo Council Member Foley's thanks. And Council Member, did you want to make a motion? Yes, so moved, uh, accept the report. Second. Thank you. Let's vote. Jones? Aye. Foley? Aye. Cohen? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Thank you. Great, thank you to all of our city staff and my colleagues, appreciate the really detailed reports and all the progress our team is making. I, I wanna wrap up here with open forum and just remind everyone that this is an opportunity for members of the public to comment on any items that were not agendized today. Let's head over to public comment. We'll start with Colin user one. Yeah, yesterday the police chief talked about his customer service plan. There is no customer service from uh, San Jose PD. Try picking up the phone and calling them. You can't. You cannot get through. You can call. I went down the list of numbers. You can maybe get through to a fax machine. Okay. You can't go there because they don't allow people to go to their police headquarters. Right? They're, they are completely fenced off from the public. Right, you can't get them on the phone. They don't reply to emails. They you 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 can't go there. How is that customer service from your police police chief? Mata has been talking about this for the last year. Not like they don't have a bunch of people crammed in their office or at working from home to be able to fix this. But you should be able to call your police department over non-emergency issues, questions, or comments. So. I mean, who are these people? Are they like some kind of royal family or something? I want you people to try to call them. They won't give you their cell numbers. They won't give you your business cards. They don't introduce themselves. If you ask them what their name and badge number is, they point to something and say, right here, right here. Yeah, yeah. I want to know how many people's names are right here. I got something for them right here. Okay? So I want you as a city council to start asking questions to San Jose PD about their customer service because I haven't seen it. He's got, these guys are, are, are public relations failures, I can tell you. And I mean, how am I a customer? I'm a citizen and a taxpayer, right? I demand more. We all demand more. We should all get more because if something happened to you guys, what would you do? What would you do? Are you, uh, you guys have maybe have a direct line to the right people down there because you're special. Thank you. We'll go on to Blair. Hi, Blair Beekman. Thanks for the meeting. Um, I, I hope my uh, words on the previous item, uh, my broad generalized words, uh, public comment, uh, I hope, uh, uh, you know, they can be applicable to Microsoft as well and they can take it to heart, uh, the good practices that San Jose has been trying to learn with uh, AI and, and new civil protection ideas. Uh, interesting concepts and uh, good luck in those efforts. Uh, as, as, you know, as this committee, uh, you know, it has to deal with uh, technology and surveillance technology and national security issues. A quick mention, just uh, a good luck in the efforts of uh, the peace negotiation process uh, on the Poland uh, Belarus border between Russia and, and Ukrainian officials at this time. Good luck how we can all consider ideas of peace for the future of the Ukraine region. And in uh, other items, uh, you know, attending a few uh, Berkeley City Council meetings over the past uh, six months, you know, 
they have a really, really good sanctuary city policy ideas. And yet they're a bit confused around their surveillance uh, data collection technology and aggregate data ideas. I'm wondering if San Jose, you know, I'm thinking if there is a way that, you know, we're trying to under better understand the procurement process and the beginning procurement process with local technology and data collection. Are we at a point where we can start to introduce, uh, you know, san good sanctuary city policies and ideas more to, to aggregate data ideas and, and the early procurement process and, and the demands of, uh, you know, when aggregate data is collected, we can start asking that it be a bit more specific and not as broad. I, I think we may be at the stage we can start to ask those kind of questions and what can better protect civil rights and civil protections of everyday individuals. Good luck in looking into these efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Our last public speaker is Jill. Thank you. I just have a general comment today and it's intended to more or less plant a seed into what I've been thinking lately about government. Um, I'm really concerned that a lot of the, the lack of engagement, civic engagement among people is, is due to the complexity of government. And I'll give you an idea about what I've been doing. I've been trying to get through, read through the entire Plan Bay Area 2050 plan. And I'll read the first sentence of the news release that they had just to give you an idea of what just is shocking to me. And it says defined, uh, it's defined by 35, 35, 35 strategies for housing, transportation, economic vitality, and the environment. It lays out a $1.4 trillion vision for policies and investments to make the nine county region more affordable, connected, diverse, and it goes on and lists all these wonderful things that it wants to have. Um, it also includes something that says that they wanna reduce cost burdens for riders with low incomes and paths to economic mobility through job training and a universal basic income. Um, so that was news. That was like, wow, there's a universal income being discussed at, in the um, Plan Bay Area 2050 plan, which I really had never heard of. So I thought that was very interesting. And what I want to comment on is that I feel like with government at this point, there are so many levels and so many plans and so much money being talked about and so many visions. I really don't even know where to start. Um, I am, I either decided I needed to kind of like back off for a while or dig in. And so I'm going to dig in. I'm going to do my best. But I think due to the complexity of all these plans, whether it be at the county level, the city level, the regional level, we're overwhelmed. And at some point, if we don't figure out how to talk to uh, the taxpayer, the citizen, the resident, um, in a simplified way, we are just going to continue to suffer. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that comment. Okay, we are adjourned. Thank you all. Have a great rest of your day.